To begin our discussion today on upper extremity arteries, it's first important to understand what kind of test you should do. And I think the type of test you do is really determined by the question you want answered. When we come to arterial testing, I really think the first question should be, is there arterial disease present? It's a yes or no answer to this question. And I think that uh, physiologic testing will tell us the easiest and the quickest of whether or no um, the, there is disease or not. Once we find out a patient has vascular disease, then we can use ultrasound to actually better define the disease, the location and severity, and that's where ultrasound really comes into play. Peripheral arterial ultrasound, we know, can exactly identify what piece of the anatomy we're looking at. It can tell us a particular point where there may be something abnormal. Having that information, we can help the clinicians then direct additional intervention for their patient, whether that's uh, angioplasty and stent or surgery, but this can be direct information from the ultrasound that they can utilize for therapy. We know we can follow disease progression. We do that all the time with carotid vessels. And one of the best things about ultrasound is that we can differentiate stenosis from occlusion. We can't do that on the indirect tests. We know that we can get a very high grade stenosis um, or have a vessel completely occluded and get similar results, but we can see that difference on ultrasound. And ultrasound is great because we can get that anatomy that I discussed, but we can get the physiology. We can look at velocity waveforms and shapes, and we know what can, is going on both at that point and what uh, is going on in the tissue bed being supplied by that vessel. Well, in terms of upper extremity arterial disease, it's certainly not all that common. In fact, it only accounts for about 5% of all symptomatic extremity disease. It's pretty, pretty uncommon for us. Atherosclerosis is a player, but it's relatively rare in that most of the upper extremity arterial disease we see actually can be caused by a variety of other diseases, and they're listed here. Some of them include as I said, atherosclerosis, but various types of arteritis or embolic disease, traumatic disease, and thoracic outlet. These are problems in the large upper extremity arteries and large arterial diseases, and it only accounts for five to 10% of the patients. In this uh, figure over here, we see a vessel, this actually happens to be a common carotid artery, and we can see this diffuse buildup in the wall here, and here, and it's very typical of a patient with arteritis. We'll come back to that in a second. Well, small vessel disease is really the bulk of what we see in the upper extremity, and that's almost 95% of the patients. The testing we do there actually can vary depending upon what's going on. Certainly, we'll see some patients who may have vasospastic diseases, um, and they can be the result of um, true Raynaud's disease or Raynaud's phenomenon. We also see patients with connective tissue disorders such as scleroderma or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Other patients may have uh, coagulable states. They may also present with Berger's disease or various other types of problems including frostbite or uh, some sort of neoplasm or vibrational injury, which is actually quite common in patients who um, are laborers and use um, pneumatic tools to do their job, they can get diseases within the small vessels of their upper extremities. Now, a minute or, or two here about Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, many patients have this multicolored change that uh, um, their hands or fingers go through. Sometimes we don't know why. Um, that's only a small percentage, maybe 5 to 10% of primary Raynaud's disease. We really have no clue what's going on. Most patients present with Raynaud's phenomenon, which is secondary to a number of underlying causes, such as connective tissue disease, thoracic outlet, etc. And the patients go through this classic colorful pattern of changes. First, the digits are white, they blanch. The artery will vasospasm and shut. And there's no perfusion here, so the fingers blanch. Secondly, what happens is the blood remaining in the tissue becomes deoxy deoxygenated 
and the tissues become cyanotic or blue. Lastly, once the stimulus is removed, the arteries stop vasospasm, blood flow is returned, there is a reactive hyperemia here, uh, and we see this bright red change. So we go from white to blue to red, and we get this classic pattern we see in patients with Raynaud's. Now, in terms of the upper extremity assessment, why do we ever wind up doing ultrasound on some of these patients? Well, probably one of the big indications would be to look for a subclavian artery stenosis. Again, large vessel disease is not common, but it can occur. Most patients with subclavian artery stenosis remain asymptomatic. They don't even know they have it. It's picked up incidentally by differences in brachial blood pressures. Um, also, the few patients that I've been told that can develop symptoms due to subclavian artery stenosis are those who use their arms for their living, such as a hairdresser or something like that. They're constantly moving their arms and they may develop some symptoms as a result. Also, in patients who've had a cabbage in which they've used the left internal mammary artery um, as a conduit, if there's a left subclavian artery stenosis, th this can spell trouble for those patients as well, and they can actually get angina as a result. Probably more commonly, we're seeing upper extremity evaluations done for patients undergoing radial artery harvest for a cabbage or in a pre-op evaluation prior to the creation of a dialysis fistula. Certainly, we can also identify hemodialysis axis grafts and fistulas look for, looking for a stenosis and such, but that topic is best reserved for a, another, another lecture. We do see patients, though, with dialysis axis sites who can develop arterial steals. And lastly, we can also see patients for thoracic outlet syndrome, although in those patients we may not be doing an ultrasound as their arterial assessment. This sketch here just shows the normal upper extremity anatomy, and once we get out onto the arm, it's a pretty easy scan of the brachial and the radial and the ulnar vessels. Where the challenge comes is right here at the base of the neck because of the sternum and the clavicle hiding portions of the brachiocephalic and subclavian vessels. Um, it may be a challenge to get through all these vessels. If you have the availability of a curved linear array, um, that transducer will help uh, insinate these vessels near the clavicle. We're usually going to use a mid-range transducer for some of the subclavian evaluation. If we're looking on the forearm at the radial and ulnar arteries, we're probably going to use a high-frequency transducer uh, in order to see those smaller, more superficial vessels more clearly. We're going to look for the same things like a stenosis, calcification, wall thickening, we're going to record the peaks of solid velocity as well as vessel diameter. And in some instances, we may be asked to measure volume flow, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Now, an artery is an artery, and a normal artery should look nice and thin-walled, uh, be smooth, and have an appreciable intimal medial boundary that we can see. As we get various levels of disease, we'll see plaque and calcification and so forth. Here is a nice normal artery, companion vein underneath, and we can see nice, thin, smooth walls, no irregularities. We see a small collateral side branch up here, as opposed to these vessels, which have significant disease. Here's a radial artery down in the forearm with this intermittent calcification noted here. Sometimes it's very hard to tell whether or not this is somebody that's borderline, that perhaps this could be used. Obviously, if we see extensive calcification, that vessel is not suitable for use as a conduit. But this little intermittent uh, calcification, if you can compress that artery closed with the weight of the ultrasound transducer and pushing down and we can compress that closed, we probably still have enough compliance that the vessel would be suitable if they had no other conduit. Now over here, here's another example of a diseased artery. This is uh, a copy of a copy, so it's a little bit grainy, but we can see this person has an arteritis, and there's this uniform thickening to the vessel wall. It doesn't look like plaque at all, and that's very common in patients with an arteritis. Spectral analysis rules are going to be the same as we do anywhere else. We're going to use 60 degrees or less. We're going to record the velocities. If we suspect disease, we're going to use velocity ratio and look for post turbulence.
And if we do measure volume flow for some reason, we're going to make sure we open up our sample gate. In general, any peripheral artery, leg or arm, is going to have a multiphasic high resistance pattern. We're going to see this sharp upstroke in systole, a narrow peak coming back with a small reflected wave here. This reverse flow component is caused by the blood traveling down the vascular tree and hitting the high resistance arterioles at the end of the circuit and being reflected back. And then usually we'll see a third component, this little bit of anti-grade flow in diastole. That little bit of anti-grade flow is the result of the fact that in systole, the vessels expand. They're nice and compliant and elastic. And that expansion actually holds a volume of blood out near the wall. And we can see that expansion when we watch the pulsatility uh, occur in vessels. In diastole, when the pressure decreases, the, the walls contract back, again, due to that elastic recoil. A volume of blood that's held out there gets propelled downstream and that gives us that, that third antegrade component. Now some vessels normally, some patients have normal age-related changes where they've lost some compliance and lost some elasticity, so we may not see this third component, and we may just see two components to the waveform, but that's perfectly okay. So here we have a normal high resistance distal radial artery, but down here we have a little bit different pattern. Although we have a nice sharp upstroke and narrow peak, we see extensive diastolic flow through here. And this diastolic flow is indicating to us that this was a, a low resist or a high resistance bed, and now it's become a low resistance bed due to all this blood flow um, through diastole. This can happen in a patient who's warm, as the hand is ve very temperature sensitive and causes vasodilatation. This can also happen if a person was exercising their arm or hand for any reason and this is the type of pattern you would see. We don't want to see these types of patterns. Here there's a lot of diastolic flow, but look at the waveform itself. The waveform is prolonged and rounded. This is a Tardis Parvis-like waveform. It's delayed. This tells me right off the bat that this blood has moved through a stenosis somewhere. It's lost some energy. It's dampened out. You don't even need to know or appreciate what the velocities are here. If you just look at the waveform, you should be able to say that's abnormal. Same thing for down here. Don't even look at the absolute peak velocity. It's not important. The important part is here we have just one component, just this up and down here, this monophasic pattern in systole, no reverse flow, no reflected wave, no integrated flow through end of diastole. So we know that this is an abnormal signal and this type of pattern is observed proximal to a high-grade stenosis. All right, in terms of diagnostic criteria, there are no separate criteria for the upper extremity vessels. We're going to use the criteria that we also apply to the lower extremity. In general, these velocities are probably a little high for the upper extremity arteries, but what we're going to use really is the velocity ratio. When we see a ratio that's two to one, we uh, know we're dealing with about a 50% stenosis. When the ratio gets up to about four to one, we know we're dealing with about a 75% stenosis. And you're not supposed to say all or none or always or never, but this is a time where this is almost always holds true. So two to one ratio, 50%, four to one ratio greater than 75%. And again, we'll see this focal change. Now this slide, uh, borrowed from SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, just shows again some nice anatomy here where we start. Um, of course, the sternum is going to be kind of covering most of these vessels, so we're not really going to see the origin of the subclavian or the full extent of the brachiocephalic or anominant. But we're going to have to just come in where we can, and we see here, here's the anominant or brachiocephalic artery. We can see it coming up and horizontally coming off this vessel will be the subclavian artery as shown here and coming up more pointing up towards the head towards the neck it's going to be the common carotid artery in terms of waveforms the anominate vessel um, normally will have a fair amount of diastolic flow as shown here that diastolic flow is a result of the fact that the anominate gives rise to the common carotid which gives rise to the internal carotid so 
that is where that diastolic flow is going, up the ICA to the brain. Now the subclavian again, feeding the hand, feeding the arm, is going to be more multiphasic high resistance pattern. When we see a subclavian, though, that looks like this, we can appreciate that there is something going on. Again, we don't even have to look at the numbers. You can see there, there's extensive spectral broadening. The waveform is kind of rounded. This is a stenotic signal. And in this case, we've got velocities here in this uh, example peaking out of over 350 centimeters per second. Downstream, again, we would expect turbulence and rounding and blunting of the waveform as shown below. This is an upper extremity pulse volume recording and segmental pressure study, and we can see here tracings from the upper arm, from the forearm, and from the wrist. And on the right here, these are textbook normal. We see a small reflected wave. We see a nice sharp upstroke. On the left, we see this prolonged upstroke, this broadening here and this widening of the pulse, we lose that reflected wave. We don't see much of a change from the upper arm to the forearm to the wrist. So what we can safely assume is that the problem is at the beginning, that there is probably something up here in the subclavian leading down so that when we take a look in the upper arm, we already see a change, and that change is probably the result of a subclavian artery stenosis. We can see that in these waveforms, and we can also see here in the Doppler uh, pressure measurements in that we have greater than a 40 millimeter mercury difference left to right. We don't really see uh, much of a change as we go down uh, to the wrist level in terms of a drop off in those pressures. So this is a, a classic uh, pattern that we would expect to see in a patient with a left subclavian artery stenosis. Continuing on out the arm, um, what we want to do is see these nice paired veins with a companion artery, and here's the axillary artery and vein. Um, we see the Doppler placed in the axillary artery here with a peak velocity of around 100. We are seeing this multiphasic high resistance pattern, which is exactly normal. Further down the arm, we're going to follow the brachial artery. The brachial is very important because um, some general surgeons like to create dialysis fistulas using that brachial artery as an inflow source. They'll do the basilic vein transposition and transpose that basilic vein in anastomosis to the brachial artery. And that's why we really need to pay good attention to this, measuring the diameter and looking at the velocities. And again, a very textbook normal brachial artery waveform that we see here. Continuing on down, that we'll look at both the radial and the ulnar. Remember, in the forearm, we've got one artery with two small veins on either side, the companion veins to the radial artery. This is the radial artery. These vessels up here that are all by themselves with nobody next to them, those are veins. And if you, you see these and they happen to be thrombosed, it's not a thrombosed radial artery, look around. The radial artery has to have their veins next door, and that's going to be your landmark to distinguish this from this, and don't get confused. Again, the radial artery, multiphasic, a high resistance pattern, except if your patient is hot or they're vasodilated. Some drugs can cause this as well, um, and we can see this vasodilatation. However, it is still normal. One of the other areas that we get asked to look at the upper extremities for are in patients undergoing a coronary artery bypass. We need to evaluate the radial and the ulnar arteries to make sure um, they're adequate, uh, look for calcification, confirm that the vessel is still compliant, and we're going to record the diameter and the velocities within these vessels. In terms of measuring the diameter, it's probably best if we use a transverse view and uh, we can best appreciate that we're not oblique to this artery. Uh, you can do it sagittally, but we have to be very careful. In this example, the vessel uh, measured sagittally was 2.6 millimeters versus 2.8 millimeters transverse. That's all right, but if somebody is borderline, we want to be careful and make sure we don't disadvantage them. This data was uh, early data we compiled 
uh, back in Albany looking at males and females and diameters and velocities. Females did indeed have slightly smaller radial arteries than males and as such having the smaller tube to put that blood flow through we had slightly higher velocities. Why we uh, look at the radial artery and the ulnar artery is we want some sort of assessment of really what's going on to the perfusion to the hand because we want to make sure that if we take that radial artery out, number one, it's a good conduit to use, but number two, that the uh, digital perfusion will be maintained because not everyone has a complete palmar arch. One way to test for that is with physiologic testing. Again, here's an example where it's probably better to use physiologic testing than arterial ultrasound imaging. Here we have um, PVR waveforms of the digits of the right hand and then we've manually compressed the radial artery and we repeat these and we can see that these are textbook normal. We've got again a sharp upstroke, a narrow peak, the reflected wave here, um, no change all the way down, but when we compress that radial artery, we pretty much flatten these waveforms out. So we can safely say that this kind of patient, we don't want to harvest the radial artery to use for coronary bypass because we probably will get some digital ischemia. And this is a result of the fact that the person is radial dominant and likely has either uh, a small or uh, ulnar artery that's not perfusing much or certainly not perfusing uh, adequately into the hand. The other reason why we're going to evaluate these native vessels, as I said before, would be in patients prior to the creation of a hemodialysis axis fistula or graft. Um, in general, we're still going to do the radial and the ulnar arteries, but we're going to add a brachial artery evaluation. We certainly also will look at the veins. And this might be the one place where a surgeon might want to know what the volume flow is through uh, those vessels in order to determine perhaps potential in terms of uh, runoff bed. This diagram shows a number of uh, variations with the creation of a fistula. Of course, uh, the old and most common here, radiocephalic uh, fistula down here at the wrist, a basilic vein transposition here, loop grafts, and, and various other configurations uh, so that you can see why they need to know what the arteries look like in order to uh, make the best conduit. Measuring volume flow, every machine pretty much nowadays can do this. The operator is going to dial in the vessel diameter. The machine calculates the radius, obviously is half the diameter, and then measures the area of that vessel as uh, the radius squared times pi. Uh, pi. Then what we also do is dial in um, a series of um, uh, some calipers to uh, obtain the mean velocity over a series of cardiac cycles and you can see this aqua line drawn through here which is actually the mean velocity occurring here. So we've measured the area of the tube, we know the mean velocity of the tube, multiply those two together and we can get volume flow through that particular artery. Well, after we've created a fistula, we can run into problems in the upper extremity. Certainly the, one of the most common is a pseudoaneurysm. It's going to have the classic appearance as any pseudoaneurysm with this swirling of color in two directions. Um, we may not only have a pseudoaneurysm, but we may get an arterial venous fistula, which is shown here between the brachial artery and brachial vein following a brachial artery catheterization for coronary cath. And we can see also in addition to the fistula, this small um, pseudoaneurysm present as well. If we're being asked to evaluate a hemodialysis axis graft, and we start out and we are looking at the brachial artery, and we see this kind of pattern, which is high resistance, we know that there's a problem already. This should be our, our flag to say, well, this is actually a good brachial artery Doppler signal, but it's not a good signal in a patient with a fistula. In a patient with a fistula, we need a low resistance signal because that fistula is created and we should have lots of diastolic flow. So if you start out here, we're probably dealing with somebody with a thrombosed fistula.
The other complication that can occur in fistulas is arterial steel, and it's really important in these patients uh, to know your orientation and be careful of how you're positioned and uh, make sure that you have everything set correctly. Because we see here in this example, heads up here, hands down here. So flow should be going towards the hand or away from the transducer, away from that Doppler beam. So it should be a negative shift, but if we look over here, this is actually a positive shift. Even though it sort of looks like an arterial waveform, although a slightly strange one, it's a positive shift. So it's coming in this direction, from the hand back to the fistula, and that's a patient that needs that kind of um, problem addressed. Just a couple more slides now. Um, this is a patient with Berger's disease um, completely, and almost all of them are associated with heavy cigarette smoking. They get this digital ischemia and cyanosis. Here we have a radiograph showing, an angiogram, I should say, showing um, thoracic outlet compression with a normal subclavian artery at rest. The arm is moved into a certain position, and we get compression of the subclavian artery. That is very easy to document. Again, not necessarily with ultrasound, but with physiologic studies as shown here, where we can see that um, we can get digital PPGs in certain positions, um, but when we move the patient into a symptomatic pose, we can see the PPG decrease and we know we've got subclavian artery compression. Raynaud's testing, again, another type of digital problem. We see the PVR cuff here, PPG sensor here. We can measure pressure. We can get PPG waveforms. This peaked pulse is extremely characteristic of patients with Raynaud's. Um, if you examine any of the publications coming out of Portland, Dr. Mineta's group and formerly Dr. Porter, when he was alive, they published extensively about Raynaud's and this peaked pulse appearance as compared to this type of patient, which is not really as significantly uh, displaying a peaked pulse. This is more obstructive lesion that comes into play. And this last case, an example, is a patient who used the palm of their hand to repeatedly uh, uh, hit uh, something together. What they were doing, we don't know, but again, over time, in that repeated trauma to the palm of their hand, they actually created an ulnar artery aneurysm. And we can see the aneurysm here and the thrombus within the aneurysm reduced flow lumen on color. Even though the Doppler spectrum is normal, this was uh, a patient with a, a potentially serious issue here. So to conclude, when evaluating the upper extremity arteries, we're going to use the same criteria that we do for lower extremity arterial ultrasound. Um, we can detect atherosclerosis and we can detect other things such as aneurysm and pseudoaneurysms. We can see patients with arteritis or perhaps problems caused as a result of trauma. Um, ultrasound does give us the best of both worlds in that we get the specific information on disease location and severity with both the anatomy and physiology. And certainly in addition to symptomatic patients, we evaluate our asymptomatic patients prior to certain operative procedures such as the creation of a hemodialysis access graft or use of a artery for coronary artery bypass graft. Thank you very much.